Okay. So let's have a go at, I'm going to say session four. This is like the fourth video, right? Except I'm going to click single player. I'm going to click load game. And you're going to see here, what's this? This is session four. And it's at a later time that we left the last video. And that's because, unfortunately, uh, I've already done session four. And the recording gave four minutes of my about an hour's worth of footage. Um, so I was very upset by that. Not going to lie. Uh, I've just accidentally selected the King Carloman. This is going well. Let's try again. Uh, right, there we go. Campathidio. Play. Right. So, I feel like I'm not going to capture the same pizzazz as the last um, footage. I'm a bit clo a bit more into a, a, a drink of alcohol now. A um, bit more into my beer. Um, but I will endeavour to do my best um, of... Giving, giving some thoughtful commentary. Um, I talked about an awful lot of different things, and I'm going to try and remember exactly everything I talked about um, and take you through that. So, how are we going to start this session? Well, we're going to start this session the way that we promised we would at the end of the last one, which was by running the clock a little bit to get some things to happen so that we get some new stuff to talk about, basically. Um, so, I am going to start out doing exactly that, uh, we're going to ignore this war that's currently going on over here, uh, and we're just going to we're just going to basically hit plus on the keyboard a number of times, or you can press it up here, and that's going to put us to speed five, uh, which means the game will run really, really quickly. Um, which I can indicate by pressing the space bar, which is on pause, uh, and we can start out by having a completely different event uh, to what I generated in the last session. But that's fine. So, what's happening here? Um, we have got an event that says, uh, Richildis might fancy me. Uh, and the options of make a move, you will go to her chamber, or she's not my type, lose 5 prestige. Well, we already have negative 51 prestige. I don't particularly want to make that any worse. Uh, and... Oh, even better, this is our daughter-in-law. Um, so... If we click on her, we can see that she is married to our son. Uh, so, obviously, nothing bad could possibly come from having an affair with our son's wife. Let's do it. This is where all great role plays are, uh, are made by clicking on the, the stupid option. So, look, make a move. Um, so, I've just hit spacebar again to pause. I went to uh, Rashildis' chamber and gave her a good tumble. It's good to be the Count. Uh, so that's just something that can happen from time to time. It will happen even more if you have taken the seduction focus. I think it's seduction. So we're on carousing focus right now. But yeah, seduction. Uh, when it's seduction, you will literally try and sleep with anyone with two legs. Uh, providing they're the opposite sex, of course. Um, right. So uh, now that that hilarity has happened, I am going to unpause the game again but this time I'm gonna pause the footage so that you don't have to watch too much of me um, babble away and hopefully this time it's not gonna throw away all my footage so let's give it a go okay so we're recording again hopefully uh, and we've received news that my lover Richildis is with child hopefully she will be able to persuade her husband to be the real father um, we can only hope, so let's hope that we haven't just already created a fractured kingdom for ourselves. Uh, I'm going to pause. There is actually something we can already... Well, there's a couple of things that we can talk about. Um, not quite as good as the way that it happened in the last playthrough, but I think there's enough to, to give us something to, to talk about. Uh, so, number one, before we talk about what's going on over here. Uh... We have a pop-up here which says Air Liege's Council is discontent. Now, last time I assumed that that had happened because there was a change in characters um, on the vassal side. Um, but in actual fact, that's not what has happened at all. If we click that, we can see that two of the councillors on our Liege's Council, not our council, uh, are not very happy anymore. They have the sad red thumbs down that Facebook won't let everybody have on their Facebook page. Um, so if we click on um well if we click on them and then click on their liege we can see why that is and that's because 
if we read this at the top here, Duke Roudbert of Alemania. Um And if you're a keen observer and you remember the last playthrough, um, you'll remember that that's not who our liege was. Our liege had a different name. Um, and one of the useful things there is we can have a look in um, this section here, which shows the family of this character, and we can see that there's a dude here who looks suspiciously like our previous liege and also has the same name, Duke Anibi, and he has this little skull that tells us he's dead now. Um, he's gone and he has been succeeded by his son, Duke Roudbert. So our liege is no longer um, Duke Anibi, it's now Duke Roudbert. Um, so uh, it also tells us that he died of an accident on the 3rd of December uh, 769 at the age of 49. Um, that could be that he died of accident, or it could be that someone killed him and they did such a good job of killing him that nobody actually knows that it was them. Um, or it could just genuinely be that the guy had an accident. I actually had a playthrough where my character got drunk and fell down the stairs uh, and died <laughs> from his injuries. So it can, it can happen. Um, it can totally happen that way. Or it could be that someone... Um, put a bunch of manure in in, a, in a, a cart and made it explode. That's a real thing, guys. That can happen. Um, so, yes, uh, you've learned something new there, which is uh, you've seen how succession sort of works, uh, and you've seen how you can tell who used to be the parent of a character um, so that you can see, like, the family ties. Um, if we're looking at this screen, we can see that his sibling, uh, so Duke Robert's sister... Um, the Countess of Bern, um, she has a little mask, and if we hover over that, it says Irma is in hiding. Um, so that sort of leads me to believe here, like, this guy died of an accident, and I'm doing air quotes, which is great for radio. Um, this woman is in hiding, and that's probably because somebody's trying to plot against her, and they found out that she's being plotted against. And one of the options that you get when that happens, particularly if it's your heir, is to send them into hiding, um, so that nobody can hurt them. The disadvantage of going into hiding, of course, is um, you cannot perform any character interactions while you're in hiding. It's one of the other scenarios where you might get a regency. Uh, if you're in hiding, you can't run your realm. Um, in fact, if we click on her, we might even be able to see that, because she's a countess. Um, we don't see that. Maybe I'm wrong. I feel like I'm not wrong. She doesn't have any vassals. Maybe I am wrong. She's a countess. Oh! She's a countess because she's married to this guy. She's not actually the countess. She doesn't actually run the uh, run the realm, so that is why there isn't a regency. So this guy has sent his wife into hiding, or this guy has sent his sister into hiding. One of one or the other. Um, but yes, um, I think that triggers a regency, and it makes sense because you can't control things while you're uh, in hiding. You can also go mad. Uh, being social distancing is hard, guys, um, as we all well know. Um, so that's that's explained some of the stuff. Uh, on that menu, uh, which is useful. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything else I've missed out. Um, I guess it's good to like let you know that like you've got relations, vassals. So relations will show you like marriage ties. It will show you lovers and rivals. So you can get people who just characters that just dislike you, uh, and then they'll they they set their their life's mission to make your life miserable by undermining your schemes and. Uh, maybe declaring war on you and all sorts of other uh, funsies, so they'll appear in here. Uh, or you can have friends. You can have someone who just becomes a dear, dear friend, which is quite, quite cool. Um, vassals, your court. Um, I did explain this in the last playthrough, so um, let's use our court rather than uh, rather than Duke Roadbert's court. What is your court, and who is a courtier? Um, I, I did go through that, so we are Count Bethelio of Thurgo, but we're not an autocrat. We're not sitting there as the sole representative of the realm. The game sometimes treats us that way. So, uh, this duchy, this kingdom, this county are represented by their character. It's a very character-centric game. Um, but, in turn, we 
have vassals, but we, we don't just have vassals, uh, and we don't just have councillors, but we, we do have a court. Uh, and in fact, if we hover over that, it tells us that the court is mainly consists of various unlanded nobles, but also councillors who can be landed vassals. Uh, rulers can house only a certain number of adult people in their court, depending on the tier of their title. Beyond that number, court expenses will increase. And then it's also affected by like technology uh, and your laws and, and things like that, as you can see in the tooltip below that's telling us we have a base count of 16. So we're allowed to have 16 members of court before we start paying extra money, basically. Uh, and that's only for uh, adults, I believe. You can have more children. Um, so we can see in our court, there is uh, our Chancellor, uh, our Marshal, and uh, Mayor Frederick of Davos. Um, they're there for... because they're councillors. I think they might also appear... No, they don't appear if they're vassals. If they're vassals outside of... So if they were a vassal that just owned... Uh, uh, Bre uh, Bresgau here then they wouldn't be in a court whereas these guys are actually in the same county um, I think that's right um, this game's complicated so I might get some stuff wrong but I think that's right um, equally we have um, these three people here um, in our court uh, and you might notice these two have like a blood drop symbol next to them and, and like a gold border to it and that means that they are of our dynasty and they are a close member of our dynasty um, so that's that's a useful thing to know uh, in this case they're both our grandson um, the guy just below this uh, is our heir so you can see him already there but the little crown indicates that he is our heir um, just gonna check that the video is actually recording it says that it is so good Let's carry on. Um, so, yes, it, it says that he's our heir. Um, who else have we got? Uh, so we've got uh, Richis, uh, Richildis, who we've already um, had sex with. And she is our, um, our lover now. So now we're going to multiple times with this one. Um, she's a courtier, but she's also actually our son's wife. Uh, and then we have uh, Wolfhild here. And if we hover over her, she... It says she's just our courtier. If we click on her, she was actually married to Baron Lutbert of Glerns, who um, died under suspicious circumstances. I wonder who did that. That wasn't us, was it? Um, but yes, she's in our court because she was married to this guy. Um, then we've got Augusta, who is our wife. Uh, then we've got our court chaplain. Uh, we've got the commanders, the two commanders of Thurgau. And... Uh, lastly, we have uh, Frederica, and she is a courtier, and if we click on her, she isn't anybody. She's not related to anybody, so she's not related to any of our dynasty. She's not related to any of our vassals. She's lowborn. She's not of a house. She, she's not important herself. She doesn't have any claims. Um, so she's literally, for want of a better word, useless, um, except that we can marry her off. Or... Well, we can marry her out of our realm if we don't want her. Uh, or we can marry her to someone in our realm. Um, and this is something that we I did discuss, so I'll go through it again. Um, so, the court is important because you have a lot of power over people who are in your court. If we, for argument's sake, uh, select this guy who is not in our court, not even related to us in any way. We can right-click on him and the, here are all of the like, options that we get. Um, we could, for instance, arrange a marriage for this guy. Or arrange a betrothal. In this case, it's us suggesting someone. Um, the only people that we can suggest, however, for this, um, this marriage proposal, are people in our court. Unmarried people in our court. So we, we can marry off Wolfhild, Frederica, uh, we could marry off our two commanders because they apparently don't have a spouse right now. Or we could betroth, not marry because they're children, um, we could betroth our two grandsons. Um, but only characters from our court are available for us to do that. Um, it Likewise, when we click on his blank portrait, these are the characters in his court that are unmarried and um, that he has... You know that they're 
their various so in this case it's his steward a commander a spy master and a chaplain so they're they're all uh, either hold a minor title or a um a court position um your but it, it just goes to show your court isn't just your important people it's not just your counselors it could also be we're currently looking at Alicia's court um it, it could also be um just people who you've invited and the reason that this is important is when we married uh countess augusta we couldn't marry her until she was in our court so we invited her to get married to us or in fact we invited her i think her father if we click on her and go family she doesn't have any so it would have been actually been her former a former lord i'm not going to say lord instead of liege because as with this courtier in our court at the bottom frederica we're her liege because she's in our court but she's not a vassal and that's a big difference so uh vassal wise if we click on vassals this guy Luthbrand, cannot leave our realm not voluntarily anyway um he can't just decide you know what i don't like being your vassal anymore i want to go be the vassal of the king of bavaria he can't do that because he's our vassal he could fight us for independence, and then he could make himself the vassal of the King of Bavaria. That's that's allowed. Or the King of Bavaria could have somebody in his court who has a claim on his lands uh, that means that it makes him the heir. Um, so the, the the heir of the heir of this vassal could be someone else not this vassal because he's actually so un unimportant he only owns our holding but if he was a count i'm wondering if we maybe we can show that here yes we can show that here how awesome is that uh so this guy i don't think he's related he might be actually oh he is actually related it, that's his child interesting okay but this guy in any case his heir is of a different, a completely different um, county. They're not these. These are not tied together. These lands don't belong with one another right now. This guy is an independent. Well, he's not independent. He's under. He's under the the same liege as we are. But he is a guy who owns this underneath this larger realm, this duchy. Um, this guy is the son. Of the guy who owns Zurich Gau. But. Again. His liege is not his father. His liege is our liege. The one who owns this duchy. So they are in, in many respects. A separate realm. And that's similar to what we discussed before. When we said about Thurgau and Chur. If we had two sons and we died. Thurgau would go to one and Chur would go to another. Uh, and those realm. The, the realm is then not united. Those they're not a vassal of one another so they're not tied together um so in this scenario if count hunfred dies his heir is count adalbert of zurichgau if count adalbert of zurichgau dies his next of kin is his son so the realm would then get inherited back the other way um so you can see like the transfer how the transfer of power could work so in this particular scenario if either one of these die their their realm will expand like the other whichever one doesn't die the realm will expand um although this guy here who's 20 has currently got betrothed to this girl who is 14 in two more years time she becomes of age so they can then have children um and at that point his heir would no longer be his father it would be his son uh, and that means that's where it really splits off then because then the chance of reuniting this realm becomes that much harder um, because this this guy would still have a claim um, or actually he doesn't have a claim he has no claim at all on Zurich he only has a claim on the county of Schwyz uh, even um, there he's got no claims in there um, is that the same for his father it is 
So, yeah, they are right now completely separate realms, and they can only be easily united through warfare or through the death of one of these characters where they don't have another heir. If this guy has another son, then his realm, Zurichgau, would still be on the cards to go to the guy in charge of Sphis. Because he only because his eldest, he's only got um, one son. If he had two, he only has one holding, and it would go to his eldest. If that makes sense. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's explained how like the court works, um, and it's also explained how um, like a little bit of inheritance works. So it, the scenario we were trying to give is if we had a vassal, they can't just leave. They could leave via inheritance, so like here, that realm could be united with that realm. Um, so if the king of Bavaria, for some reason, was the heir to our son owning Chur, then that realm could could leave, in theory. Um, but they can't just up sticks. A courtier, however, can, um, with our permission. Um, um, or they can, or they can just leave if they get a better offer. I don't think, I don't think they need our permission to that. So, for instance, if we hit the full stop uh, and we go to join court, yes, uh, and we just right-click on this guy, we can do invite to court, and it tells us there you can always invite landless characters to join your court, although they will probably not accept unless they like you much better than their current liege. Um, so it's normally about whether or not they get something out of it. Um, a lot of times people will come to your court um, if they have a claim and they think that you will press it for them. Just taking a drink, sorry. Um, so can I find you an example of that? Yes, this guy has a claim. This guy, uh, the little crown symbol next to his name. And he will join our court. Uh, will it tell us why he would join our court? Well, in fact, we can right-click him, do invite to court. And if we hover over it, uh, there you go. He would join us because his liege is unable to press any of his claims. So he would join us in the hope that we would press the claim on his behalf. Um, I am not going to explain that in this video because claims are quite complicated. Um, and I'd rather do it when we actually have a concrete example that we're going to press. Because you press a claim um, and it has wide-ranging advantages and you can and disadvantages. You can get in quite a mess press, pressing a claim for a character who is not of your dynasty. So um, let's leave that for now. Uh, but that was just to show you that you can invite people to your court. And these people are in your court. They can leave your court to go join somebody else's court. Uh, and... Did I say already? If I didn't say, we have complete control over who they marry. If you, if someone is in your court, you have a, you're able to do more interactions with them. Um, so if we click on uh, self and we click on court, uh, and we, we, in fact, S son would be a good example, except that he's already married. So our grandson, for instance, we can arrange a betrothal for him. So uh, we can we can marry him off to someone in our court. Because these two women are in our court, we can click them, and then that means that we are proposing a marriage. In fact, if I click them without clicking send. Um, yeah, the only thing that stops that from happening is that Count Bathelia must not be imprisoned. Um, you notice there's no, like, um, tooltip saying, oh, she would marry him because she likes him plus seven or, or whatever. And that's because she's in our court. We can force her to marry. She has no say. If we tell someone in our court to marry, they must. That also applies to our grandson. He has no say in this. Neither does his, uh, neither does his father, our son. Um, we can force anyone in our court to do as they are told. Um, at least in terms of marriage. Um, so that's one of the other powerful things about having somebody in your court. If you can get a character into your court, you can do with them as you wish. Um, likewise, though, if we were to... We don't actually have a daughter, as far as I'm aware. Or a sister. Uh, no, we have no... Uh, we could show with our son. It's not quite the same. We could arrange a betrothal. Um... 
only within our court. We'd have to actually find a character first. So if we do dot and we find any woman, any woman will do. We can arrange a betrothal. Perhaps not with her for some reason. She's probably already married. Let's do married no. Try with her. There you go. Arrange a betrothal to our grandson. Currently she says no because he's too young. Um, but uh, if this marriage worked, as in she said yes, then I think I'm getting this right and I could be getting the description of this wrong. So if I am, I apologise. Uh, because this is not a matrilineal marriage, she would join our son in our court. I think that's right. I could be wrong. It could be that he moves to her court. Um, I cannot remember the way around that it works. Um, certainly, normally what you do is you, you, you marry off your daughters. Your sons are far too valuable. Um, you, you marry off your daughters um, to secure alliances and things like that. Uh, and when you marry off your daughters, one of the side effects of that is that they move court. They leave your realm and they go join the court of their husband. Um, and I think that's the right way around. I think it's d determined on the the power in the marriage. So a non-matrilineal marriage, the power is with the man. And a matrilineal marriage, the power is with the woman. So if we married our daughter matrilineally to, uh, a, let's say, a prince of um, West Francia, I think I'm correct in saying that that would then move the prince of West Francia into our court. Um I think that's that's correct. Um, so yes, that's explained what courtiers are and what the advantages of are, what power uh, courtiers display and stuff like that. Uh, so how long have we been going? Let's have a quick look at the video. We're still recording. We're 26 minutes in. Oh, it feels like a lot longer because I've already recorded this once. But let's talk about the other thing that I discovered or that I did and, and explained. So there's a couple of other things that are currently happening on the screen that give us interesting things to talk about. Um, let me just take another swig. It's thirsty work, this. Um, so, if we, number one, ha have a look at what's going on here, we can see that these two armies are fighting one another. Uh, if you recall from the previous episode, the king, uh, not the king, the Duke of Aelmania, our boss, uh, now the son of our previous boss, is fighting a war against the king of Bavaria over Augsburg here. Um... And it looks like he's had quite a successful prosecution of this war so far. Um, because Augsburg has these lines in it. See these gold and black bars? Um, and it might not be so easy to tell. If you look at the shield of our liege. Which he's currently fighting over. Look at his royal crest. Uh, same on the little flag there. In fact, I could just click on him, right? I could just show you our leash in big there. This this here. Um, it's black and gold yellow the e kind of colour, which is what, what that is there. What that is telling us, because those bars are unbroken, is if we click on it, we can see it this county is made up of a number of holdings. So it's made up of a county capital, uh, it's made up of a bishopric and of a city. Um, and then there are a number of uh, royal crests on shields displayed throughout this. So I'm just going to quickly explain what that means. Uh, the top uh, crest here shows that this county belongs in the kingdom of Bavaria. That's why it's got the king, um, the king's crown on it, um, and it's got his shield, his crest. Um, so that. That there tells us that this realm, or this this county, exists within inside that realm. It shows us the top level title for the control of this um, county. Further down in this holding, on the far left, we can see a shield with a little eagle inside of it. And that says it's the county of Landek. Um, and if we click on the count of Landek, we can see that that is his shield. His shield is the county of Landek. Um, he also has um, the county of Augsburg, which is the actual county itself. So Landek is just here. Um, so if we click on, click back on um, Augsburg, 
this tells us um, who owns this um, this county, basically, and it's it it belongs to the Count of Landek. That's the, the he that's his primary title, uh, and that's what it's showing us there. On the far right of this holding, we can see again the Kingdom of Bavaria, and that's because the King of Bavaria uh, is the liege of the Count of Landek. Uh, and in the middle, we can see the Duchy of Almania. We can see our liege's shield. Um, because he currently controls that holding. He has sieged it down. Which is actually what's going over, hi on, over here. On in uh, Regensburg over here. Um, you can see the trebuchet um, firing away and the burning castle. Uh, because this particular army uh, of Moravia is currently sieging uh, Regensburg. It's not a good day for the King of Bavaria. It looks like he's going to lose over here. Uh, and it looks like he's, he's going to lose over here. Um, so... We can also see that all three of the holdings that consist, that the County of Augsburg consists of, have our liege's shield in the middle. Uh, and you can also see just up here that this count is currently defending against these two, um, these two uh, characters, the Duke of Almania and High Chief uh, Mogia of Moravia. So, why am I pointing out the uh, three holdings? Because that's what these lines mean. These lines mean that this county is fully in control of the Count of... Sorry, of the Duke of Almania. Um, over here, up in Ulm, which we can see the situation is reversed. On the left hand and most side, we can see the Duchy of Almania because that is our Duke's primary title and he owns this realm or this land. On the right hand side, we can see the Kingdom of Middle France here because this kingdom is the top title that owns this because our liege reports into the king. And in the middle, we can see the Kingdom of Bavaria is the controlling faction. But if you notice the difference, so the colours are the same as well, right? So if you look at the colour in the crest of the Kingdom of Bavaria, it's white and like blue. Um, we've got like white and blue. But if you notice, the lines here are solid and the lines here are dashed. And that means if we click on it, uh, we can see that actually they only control Tech, which is the county capital. They don't control these two holdings here. So the solid lines indicate a region that is, or a, a county that is fully under the control of another faction they don't show for uh fries is that uh frising uh because um it's not controlled by anybody other than its owner so it shows their faction color uh but where it's owned by someone or controlled not owned i should so this is controlled by its rightful owner this is um or owned and controlled by its rightful owner whereas this is Owned by its rightful owner, but controlled by the person contesting it. If that makes sense. Uh, okay, so that's explained a few more concepts. Um, what else can we talk about? Well, we can talk about this battle that's happening here. Uh, so, number one. Um, the battle itself. We can't click on, annoyingly. Um, the, the little dots, I believe, if I recall, indicate the phases of the battle. We should be able to click this and it should launch uh, a little pop-up that shows us tons and tons of detail, because it's paradox, about what's actually going on. A lot of it's nonsense, you don't need to care about it. Who's got the bigger number and whose bar looks best is basically what you need to pay attention to. Um, and we'll just quickly discuss what that means. So, the number is effectively the number of men. Uh, the bigger the number, the better. The bar underneath kind of represents an abstract value um, of kind of cohesion, organization, um, morale, um, all of those concepts sort of like fudged together. Um, so it's not like hit points, although I guess it kind of functions like hit points. But it doesn't indicate dead people. It indicates how willing or prepared or able an army is to fight. Um, so right now, uh, we can see that the King of Bavaria's army, which is run by Mayor Heinrich, um, who is a character, 
in fact, we can find where he comes from. We should be able to click on the armies. Uh, oh, we can. We can click on the armies at least. We just can't open the combat. Uh, so if we click on the army, um, it's actually take us and taken us, to us to the control of the army. So it's not showing us Mayor Heinrich. It's showing uh, King Tassilo. Uh, so let's just hit full stop instead, or period if you're feeling American. Um, and type in Heinrich. It was Heinrich, wasn't it? Hein Maybe I'm... Oh, I'm looking for women. I'm not going to find him there. Women can't lead armies. Uh, Heinrich. Really? Am I completely wrong? No. Oh. I'm, I'm, I am wrong. He, he's not going to join my court, is he? We're at war with him. Uh, and he's also got a title. There you go. There he is. Uh, the Mayor of Cham. So we can click on him. And we see that he's currently the mayor of this place over here. Um, why why do I bother to bring this up? Um, I bother to bring this up because it lets you know that he is a landed character. He's a character in the game. He's not a nobody. Uh, he exists and he has potentially some worth. Um, so why is this guy fighting in this army? Well, he's probably fighting in this army because he's a commander. Hover over him. Yes, the mayor of Cham is the commander of Bavaria. Uh, and if we click on Bavaria click on the king um, it's not going to show us he's a commander if we click on air cell air own council click on minor titles scroll down we can see that we've appointed two commanders as well um, so we've got Manfred and Ulderisch here so he's a, he's a character within the realm who's been appointed the, this minor title basically um, again why do I mention that because stuff can happen when you fight battles um, this is a character-driven game, and then there are character-driven consequences. Um, so, um, one of the things that could potentially happen is he could die. Um, fighting in this combat could be—he could—he could get an arrow to the eye. I mean, that's happened to a relatively famous English king in the past, I'm sure, um, and that would just end end his play. Uh, he would appear as a dead person, and then his holdings would go to whoever his heir is, or be reclaimed by his liege. Um, he could uh, actually have a really good combat. He could prove himself worthy. He could cut down several hundred men and become feared. Um, or just become a tactical genius. Um, which is good for him. Um, or he could get a, um, a vent that fires that creates like a, a personal combat. So if you remember we had put... We mentioned personal combat score. Um... So, we're minus two in personal combat. We're pretty crap. Uh, and given given what we're just talking about, does what does that mean? Um, does that mean that we're bad at leading armies? No, it means we're bad at personal combat. Um, so if we go and lead a fight, if we if we have a battle just like these two uh, are doing here, uh, and let's say two commanders uh, end up an event fires that means the two commanders end up finding each other on the battlefield or maybe one of the like vaunted lieutenants issues a challenge to our leader um we might get an option to choose how we'd like to react and then a dice roll would decide what happens or we might get locked into just something happens and we didn't get a say um or if we have good or bad stats that might also again uh, choose, uh, give us different choices that we could make and and influence the um, influence the outcome of the battle um, so what might we want to do about that um, so if I can show you another example by raising our levy so that's a thing that we want to talk about within itself but by raising our levy you can see that there's a little ruler present symbol here uh, and that lets you know that um, we are currently leading this army bravely risking our own life uh, that gives a morale boost to our army that we're leading uh, but also like it said we're bravely risking our own life and I've just discussed some of the possibilities that could happen to us as a character for leading that army so we might not want to do that let's dismiss our levies um, and go to our character screen and then right here right next to the you might not have this barber symbol depends on your DLC um, if you you you'll see here this little sword and shield we have the leading armies button if I click that we are now forbidden from leading armies 
Um, personally, leading one of your armies would give it a morale boost, but we're not going to do that. We're going to say, we are so bad. Firstly, two things, right? We're, we have a really, really bad martial score. Um, so, we are a bad commander. We should not be in charge of an army. Um, you can be a good commander and have a bad personal combat score. Because you could be a tactical genius, but just be no good at holding a sword. That also happens if you did have a glorious, um, a glorious uh, a military career, but then somebody chopped your arms off. I mean, that that would probably affect your personal combat score, um, but it might not affect your ability to think critically. So you can be a good commander, uh, as is evidenced by your martial score. Um, so we're, we don't really want to uh, lead an army with a, a martial of six. Remember, ten is average. Um, in fact, if we look at our own commanders, uh, we can see that we've got a whoops. We can see that we've got a commander of nine and a commander of thirteen. And if we just hover over those, because it doesn't tell us for six on our own for some reason, uh, we can see that a marshal of nine is considered decent. Um, I would disagree. It's average because it's below average because the average is ten. Um, and a marshal of thirteen is considered competent. So that gives you an idea. These two people should lead our armies not us um so that that gives you an idea of that but then personal combat is what dictates what happens in those events that i've mentioned so what's the other thing that can happen uh in a in a conflict like this well the other thing that can happen is um you could be taken prisoner um that's that's also a thing that can happen um either because one of those events or instead of dying um in a victorious fight you could you could be captured, um, which is bad. Uh, and likewise, that's what this guy is currently running a risk of happening there. Uh, the mayor, mayor, uh, mayor Heinrich, is not just a com he's a commander, but he also owns territory. He's a landed character. So he's actually relatively important within the kingdom of Bavaria himself. Why do I mention that, you ask? I'm so glad that you asked, because if we click on here, we can see the uh the war that's currently going on so we can tell that this started because our liege uh i think it was actually our former liege but our liege got uppity just going to take a drink oh that's some good beer right um our liege started this war um because uh it's fight well he's fighting over this territory that's not ours for a start that's the big giveaway but i believe that the attacker starts on the left and the defender is on the right um um, we can see the contested title there. Uh, so that's the shield and the crest for the county itself. Um, so he started this war and he's currently winning this war. So you can see, you can kind of see it down there, although it's not the easiest thing to read. Uh, but it's definitely here in this war score box. So if we hover over that, that gives us way more information and something else to talk about. Um, so there's a bunch of positives and negative modifiers that are currently happening Um inside of um inside of there and we're going to discuss each one in turn so firstly he is suffering a negative three percent penalty to his war score uh because he has lost control of tech in ulm uh so if we click on ulm that's this county capital here so this holding not the county the holding has been lost uh if we go back uh, he is getting plus 5.4, plus 5.7, and 8.4 for the occupation of three holdings in Augustburg. That's here. These three holdings that are currently held. Um, likewise, he is getting plus 3.33 uh, for controlling Augsburg. We've already discussed that. The the dash line or the non dash lines there indicate he fully controls that area so there is a definite advantage to fully controlling the zone uh, when you're fighting a war particularly if it's the the uh, the the province or the or the uh, section of because you could actually fight over a, a full uh, duchy which contains many different um, counties um, so the, the actual uh, contested title, um, if, if you control that, you get even more war scores. So right now he's getting plus 3.3 .3 because he's controlled it for a little while. Um, but because that's the actual title they're fighting over, he'll get what's called ticking war score. Again, if you're familiar with Stellaris, um, ticking war score is um, 
something that happens there as well. So um, that will that will go up over time just because he is controlling the province that the war is about. Um, likewise, at the very top, uh, in fact, no, nowhere in there can you see it. In my previous playthrough uh, of this video recording, you could see a negative modifier or a, a positive modifier for the Duke of Almania because he won a, a, a large battle. Uh, he managed to beat Seven Bells out of the King of Bavaria and won such a convincing victory that he got plus 12% to his um, war score. Um, I cannot fully remember the value off the top of my head, but I have a feeling that it is 75%, which is that you can generate up to 75% of your war score from military victories. Um, so that's a that's a good thing to do. Um, uh, but you can't just win a war by beating their armies. You need to go occupy some land, preferably the title that you're fighting over. Uh, that's what really makes a big difference. Um, if if uh, if I remember correctly, if the defender successfully holds the claimed, the contested title for two years of a war i think it is they get a ticking war score as well so as a defender you can just make sure you hold on to the thing you're fighting over um which means the king of bavaria is not exactly playing this very well um but hey that's up to him uh so what happens when you get this war score up to 100 percent um you win effectively you can enforce your demands uh before that time you can try and negotiate uh but what's likely to happen is it lend in white peace which means we keep our stuff, so Ulm, we wouldn't give you Ulm. Um, we won't take uh, Augsburg. Um, we just we each keep each other's like our respective things. The war ends. Lots of people died, um, but nothing really happened. Uh, apart from the things that we talked about in the last video, like there are some negatives for taking a white piece, particularly if you're the aggressor. So the aggressor will normally take um, some prestige hits, and um, people would disrespect him for for losing and, and stuff like that um so what else with war score uh i mentioned you can take people prisoner that has quite a big impact on war score um so if this guy gets captured he's a landed character within uh the kingdom of bavaria that means that he's valuable to the king of bavaria so two things happen there one is he could be ransomed back to the king of bavaria um who, who, who will pay gold. Uh, if you capture someone, they go into your... If you go Intrigue Prisoners, they, they live here. And then you can right-click them and, and choose to ransom them. If you so desire, and you'll get some gold for doing that. The amount of gold that you get depends on how important the character is. Uh, sometimes the liege is not prepared to pay it. Um, but uh, quite often, if it's an important character, they will. Um, so if we captured the King of Bavaria's son for instance, particularly as he's heir, not just a son, but the son who is about to inherit, then he'd be worth a, a great big whack of war score uh, just alone. Uh, and then that perhaps lastly uh, leads on to the most important thing that can happen. Um, we mentioned earlier that we stopped ourselves from leading armies. Uh, well, one of the big downsides to leading armies is if you get captured or you capture the enemy's top tier character. So in this case, remember... It's a character-on-character character interaction, but this war is a kingdom versus a, a, a duchy. Like, the interaction is happening between the, the, the realms. The characters are fighting it, and they're top of that realm. So there's kind of mix between the difference between realm and character. But if you capture the leader of a realm, then you immediately get 100% war score and can enforce your demands. Because you've captured the guy who runs the place. Um, whether or not you then choose to free him, I suppose, is up to you. Um, but yes, that's a good way to do it, uh, and also a good reason maybe not to not to have your commander running around leading armies, because um, you can end up losing wars that way. Uh, what else have we not discussed? Uh, well, one thing that we haven't discussed, uh, and how long have we been going? Let me just double check the time again. Uh, we're coming close up to an hour, so I want to I want to make sure it finishes before an hour. Uh, so one other thing that we haven't discussed is what's happening in both these different provi provinces. Um, so if we, in fact, it's going to be easy to see in Regensburg. 
if we zoom in, we can see that in Regensburg, uh, the little trebuchet here, and it's firing at the castle with the, the smoke. Um, so that's a siege that's currently going on. Uh, and that's how you take control of provinces in CK2. In fact, it's uh, historically how you would have taken control of provinces in warfare anyway. Um, it's very, very rare that, like in the movies, they stormed up the battlements and put the ladders up and got the boiling oil chucked all over them and you know fired fired trebuchets until the walls fell down and and all of that um that quite often didn't happen normally what you you'd do is you'd surround the castle um and maybe you'd use your trebuchet to to shell them a little bit but maybe you'd just put a dead cow in the um trebuchet and fire that over the walls so that it could splat its guts everywhere and give everybody disease um this is the way that you would fight a war, and it's the way that you do it in CK2. Um, you don't get to fire cows, I'm afraid. Um, but um, you you starve them out, effectively, or wait for them to die of disease. Um, so you can see that here, that this castle has a garrison of 225 men, but next to it, it has, like, a, the, this, the, the thing that we've talked about already, like, a, this is the levy, uh, but it, it also kind of represents their... Um, willingness to hold on is perhaps the best way of putting it like they're org like once the levy has run out then uh the garrison will die out and like it it will fall to your to your hands basically and then it takes time for this to recharge so if if there's a war going back and forth and back and forth territories can really flip back and forth and back and forth because that once they get attacked once they lose their defense until it's built back up um so that's that's something that's useful to know about how sieging works. Um, on top of that, sieging is very profitable. If you see particularly areas that have not been sieged yet, uh, and particularly cities, um, you can in fact you can see here. Look, this particular city has been looted. Its tax is seventeen point nine, but it has been looted, which means it's suffering some negative modifiers. Um, looted province plus zero percent. So. Um, you can keep your war going, particularly when you've got mercenaries, by attacking areas that you know to be rich and plundering them. Um, that just kind of automatically happens. You don't have to, to do anything, uh, but it's it's a perk. Uh, so, like, you can sell characters back. You can also plunder uh, and pillage and raid. Just drinking a little bit more of my beer, sorry. Um, so, yes, that's... Um, sieging let's let's consider wrapping up let's talk about what's happening here um so unfortunately i can't click on the fight itself and show you the uh actual combat um but i can show you a little bit which is we've got this little plus symbol here and if we hover over that we can see that it says hills um which is increasing the defense values of one of the armies by plus 30%, plus 20%, plus 10%, plus 20%, and based on the different um, unit types, they get a better or worse buff. Um, so who's getting what bonus? Well, we can see the plus is actually on this side. Um, and if we click on this province itself, we can see that the siege is actually happening from the King of Bavaria. So the King of Bavaria, or the Mayor of... Um, Bavaria um, was sieging um, this county uh, and then the Duke of Almania's army who is led by who by a mayor of Albrecht um, then came along and, and fought this battle now he's not suffering any further debuffs other than the hills so the defender is getting the advantage of the hills um, he would have suffered debuffs, though, if he'd come from Ulm or from um, Württemberg. Um, so the reason that he would have suffered further debuffs, and, and he would have had a little negative symbol next to him there, rather than a positive, um, is because he would have crossed a river. So the River Danube is here. Uh, and, yeah, crossing a river is a big penalty as well, uh, particularly to heavy infantry, because they're wearing big heavy plate mail and whatnot so it weighs them down as they're trying to cross the river um but it also affects, it affects all unit types it just again it's disproportionate like the positives are disproportionate here the uh, the negatives are disproportionate as well based on the unit type 
Um, there are other effects as well, like forest. If we were fighting in Augsburg, I believe there's a forest there. Um, I'm not 100% certain how we actually show... Oh, there you go. If you hover over it, it tells you in the tooltip. The terrain is forest. And the climate is currently normal winter. Um, so, and it tells you there, military information. If a combat takes place here, the defender will get a defensive bonus. And it tells you supply limit as well. Supply limit affects how many troops can be in a region before they start taking attrition damage. Um, you take attrition when there are too many troops in a region for its supply. Uh, but you also take attrition in um, other scenarios like when you're sieging um, or uh, I think when you're travelling through enemy territory and stuff like that. You, you should get a little skull symbol to indicate when you're suffering attrition. I don't think these guys currently are because they're fighting. I think it's when you're idling. Although these guys don't appear to be... Although we can't see their stats. So... I don't know. We'll see that when we do some wars ourselves, I guess. Um, so that's what the bonuses are. Um, I feel like there was something else that I described last time round and that I'm missing the opportunity to do so this time. That's really disappointing. Something really cool happened last time as well, which is I let the clock run a little bit further. Uh, and our Liege's council is discontent. He's currently at war with this guy. And it turns out that... Uh, Zurichgau here, uh, Count Adalbert, is the leader of this faction to increase council power that we mentioned before. And he's actually managed to, so far, increase his strength up to 66.8% of his liege. These two people, uh, Erbhardt of Schwaben, which is this territory here, uh, and uh, Choros of Nordgau, which is this territory? No, this territory here. These, those two characters, those two counts, have thrown their weight behind, um, behind this faction. Uh, and if you remember before, I said factions differ to plots in that they are people saying, we want to get this changed, uh, so we'll all agree to do it, and then we're going to go and knock on the door of our liege, and we're going to tell him, right, enough of us believe this, you best change the rules, buster. Uh, but our, our, our liege does not have to accept. He can say no. Uh, and at that point, these guys can choose to back down if they want. Or, as is quite often the case when they've managed to muster enough men, they might actually declare war on him. And that will create a civil war and a rebellion. And if they win, they can get their way. They can increase council power. Um, so what I might do... How long's left? I've got like two and a half minutes before we've hit the hour long mark. So let's, um, let's press plus and play. Uh, it looks like uh, our liege won that fight. So let's hover over it. We can see that he's now getting plus 9.37 for the Battle of Constance. Also notice that his control of um, Augsburg has gone up to 6.6. .6. So like I said, that ticking score because he owns the uh, contested title. Uh, and he is now sieging Orm, which he owns, but he's sieging back tech. He's taking back his uh, county capital in that province or i keep saying province province might be right but uh county uh and we see that that county instead has uh the it shows you the crossing thing in this screen as well um so yeah if you attack into that county probably only from from here um from any of these regions probably not from uh Württemberg, um you would suffer the uh yeah there you go it actually tells you which ones um then you would, you would suffer a significant combat penalty. Uh, let's let the time tick. Oh, okay. So, I'm going to use a segue to explain a, a couple of other things before I wrap up. Uh, so, one is um, what's just happened here. Uh, because you, if you blinked, you would have missed it. Uh, and two is what this is up here. This is useful. These are events. Uh, that you get the big events and they pause the game and they give you a pop-up and you have to click it and as soon as you click it, it the game resumes uh, time and then you get what are called priority events and you have low priority and high priority uh, so a high priority event has just happened which is at age 22 our lover uh, Ruchildis died under suspicious circumstances what? so the wife of our son is dead now 
and she died under suspicious circumstances. We don't know what, uh, and we don't know who. But I would suspect, possibly, <laughs> possibly, if he, if, a, if her husband did find out, uh, he might not have been very pleased and he might have had her done away with. Equally though, somebody who is jealous of her could have had her killed. This game is full of people killing people. Uh, you'll get used to that within time. Um, so, actually, I did want to quickly look at uh, our leash. Wow, he's worse than us, guys. Our liege is terrible. No wonder his council's discontent. Uh, notice we've got a new alert now as well that tells us that we have an unmarried heir because his wife is now dead. So we might want to find him a new wife. Um, I can't remember if he can find his own wife. Because he's in our court, I don't think he can. If he was out of our court, then he, he totally would and we wouldn't be able to. So if he owned another... Uh, county um, and say he was our vassal we could propose that he marries one of our courtiers but we're not in charge of him marrying once he's once he's out of our court if we give him control so if we landed him um, if we landed him with Chur for instance well then we would stop controlling Chur and he would control it as our vassal and likewise he would leave Thurgau go to Chur and then he would be in his own court, and we wouldn't be able to um, we wouldn't be able to decide who he marries anymore. So it's quite important to pick who your um, heirs marry because your heirs generate their own children who become heirs in turn. So really, you want to pick a decent wife with good traits. She was good actually; she wasn't too bad. Great stewardship, decent diplomacy, uh, rubbish in every other regard. Okay, traits. Depending on oh, she was pregnant when she died as well with our child, so yeah, we're not we're not ever gonna have to worry about uh, having sired a bastard, because uh, yeah, someone killed our child and our lover. That's outrageous. We shall find vengeance. Um, so yes, it, marrying this guy would be good. We'll do that in a future playthrough. Uh, so. Yes, that's this. You can dismiss these alerts by clicking on the red X. You can also, I think, uh, open list of messages uh, that way to select the type that you want. When you've got, so we've got three here, lower ones. So this is like about characters that have been imprisoned. We don't care about these. These are they, we're being notified them about them because they happened in Middle France here, but they really we don't care. Um. Yeah, someone has joined a faction. That's interesting to us. You can... I'm trying to remember how you do it. Uh, you can... Somehow... That I can't remember. I'm going to have to look it up. You can customise this. You can decide which messages you want to see and which messages you don't. Likewise, you can right-click on these alerts to make them go away. Uh, I tend not to because it's annoying. Because they don't come back when they're relevant. Um, you kind of dismiss them in perpetuity. Um, how do you customise the messages again? I'm going to find that out for a future playthrough. And then I will show you. Because it's quite useful. Because there are some messages you'll never care about. And there are other messages that you will. Uh, so that's useful to know. Uh, and then lastly, what we're going to discuss before we wrap up. Because we've gone over an hour now. Um, is what's happened here. If we hover over this. We can see that there is the army of Mayor Heinrich, which we know, Bavaria. Then there is the army of Mayor Albrecht from Almania, which we know, these two people are at war. And then there's the army of, is that Chitibor or Moravia? Um, and that's because the guy who was sieging up here, you notice the dash lines again because he's only taken the county capital. He's marched um, this way into Augsburg where our um, where the King of Bavaria's forces have also gone, because uh, they've tried to siege Augsburg back. He's marched this way, and also so has our liege. And despite the fact that we're not in an alliance, because we're both, or I should say we, like I don't care about our liege, our liege is not in an alliance uh, with the forces of Moravia, but because they're both at war with um, the King of Bavaria, 
then they're they're both fighting him together you can get some weird scenarios in this game though where your troops will get attacked when you're not at war with people so you need to be careful especially with with like revolts uh, and moving through moving through territories where there might be armies that are hostile to people who are not you it's bizarre sometimes you get attacked and you're like but why uh, and it, it can happen in fact I'm not sure what will happen in the event uh, of these guys losing. So you can see I mentioned the morale thing before. They're going to lose again. Notice they're not dead. Before that red bar goes down to zero. That doesn't automatically mean that they're going to get stack wiped. It means they're going to lose. But it doesn't mean that their army's get dead. They'll, they'll do what's called a shattered retreat. In fact we might get to show that. If I slow the game down ever so slightly. Uh, before we wrap up. Let's see if we can show that off. It's going to be a couple of days. There we go, they lost, and if we pause a second, this little logo here means Shattered Retreat. Notice, he, he ended with something like one or two troops, but now he's back up to 198, and that's because, like I said, that bar doesn't actually mean everyone is dead. Some people could have fleed, they could be wounded, um, and the concept of Shattered Retreat is this guy will now run away and he has no control over his army anymore. He will, he will flee in a direction uh, away from the battle. He will then rally, his bar will refill, and then he will come back. So wars can sometimes be a bit of ping pong um, and they can also become like a race of who can capture what territory because like I said capturing territory is really good for your war score. Um, so that can happen. Let's just unpause for a moment. Speed up a little bit. Uh, so this is an event that's just fired for us. Uh, I'm having dinner and plenty of drinks with Urnuk. Urukachinga tonight. It's lovely. Yeah, what I'm most charmed by is him himself. Why uh, else would I not immediately stop our conversation, which has slowly begun to touch upon some almost heretical ideas questioning the salvation of God? Um, so we can say, if we do not ask questions, why did God make us curious? Uh, and you can say, this is a great discussion, probably fueled by alcohol. Uh, and he will like us a bit more because we agreed with his opinion. Or we should say, we should not speak of this, uh, because we should never question the authority of the Almighty. Um, and that gives negative 10 opinion from him for five years, because we disagreed with his opinion. Firstly, who is he? He is heir to the county of Bresgau, so we don't really give a care if we piss him off. So I know what's going to happen here is, we could say, uh, if we don't ask questions, why did God make us curious? And then it seems like this guy might be heretical and... Um, we could potentially get an invite to Lucifer's own and become a devil worshipper. Um, or we could get found and burnt at the stake. That's also possible. Um, right now, I don't think I want to go down the complexity that this chain can spawn. So I'm going to pick we should not speak of this. Because I, don't, I also don't care about pissing him off. Um, so... Uh, we can see that army that was shattered has now come back uh, and is now sieging Ulm again. So you can kind of see how the ping pong works. Uh, and equally you can now see that over here the Aelmanian army is sieging Regensburg. Part of that though is already controlled by somebody else. Um, so he's, he's sieging... Um, I think he's currently sieging the same territory see we, we can kind of take it off him even though we're not at war with him i think that's how it works i guess we'll see uh, a bit later um it yeah like i said sometimes the war mechanics are a little bit odd um so yes i think we've talked about the only other thing i really wanted to show and didn't get around to was when we raise our levy it appears in these two different realms um now our org bar is currently full but normally when you raise your levy it isn't um, it's probably full because we're not at war. Um, but normally it isn't and you need to wait for that to go uh, to grow. Um, so even if you've got like 20,000 troops and the opponent that you're going up against has got 12,000 troops. If you go and immediately throw your troops at him, then you could, you could end up losing because the the fight like that fight that was happening over here was not just determined by the number of men. It was determined by that little green bar ticking down into red whoever's bar hits empty first 
loses, regardless of how many men are left alive. So, um, you don't just want to throw your troops straight into battle. Likewise, you can see that we've raised all of it. These are our personal levy. Um, so... Yeah, this is our personal levy. Raising it is costing us 1.69 uh, gold a month. Um, because the, the levy that we control from holding, holding these two territories here. Um, notice that because we grabbed that uh, county capital in Chur, our, our levy is now quite big. We've, we've raised like four, nearly 500, um, 500 troops. Um, it's not quite 500 because we're not at maximum capacity, as you can see. And some of our levy is being borrowed by our liege. Uh, but that's I don't think that's reflected in this screen because uh, we have to give him 40% um, and yes so this is our levy and notice that it gets raised in the place where it comes from so the levy from this capital is 208 from this is 27 from this is 184 um, but notice that it gets raised in its relevant place so one of the first things that you want to do when you raise your levy is to combine them, march them into the same province, and hit the G key on your keyboard, or you can press this button here, which merges the units together. You do not want to play with tiny little stacks in this game. A couple of reasons. One, you want to give them a commander. We've, we've already made ourselves not able to lead armies, but let's assume that we wanted these armies separately. Look, no character, no character, no character. That means they're not getting any stat buffs. Uh, which means if they go up against an army that does have a character, they're just instantly at a disadvantage. Uh, so you can click the little uh, portraits and you can assign a commander that way. Um, I think we currently can't because we've only just raised them. Uh, there we go, I could do it here. So in the Oh no, they're not big enough to have a... The, the army isn't big enough to have uh, multiple... So these are flanks. I'm going to go into that in another video because this is, this is going way off course now. Um, but... Um, there's only a center flank, so we can pick an army for the center flank. Uh, a commander, sorry, for the center flank. Uh, so these are our two commanders that were from our title screen that we displayed earlier. Um, so, yes, one of the first things you want to do is merge them together. One, because you can only have so many commanders, and you want to appoint good ones. Um, but two, there's just no point having piddly little stacks. This is a game where if you've got bigger numbers, you win. So just make a doom stack. And smash your opposition with it. One of the best ways to take them down is when they raise their levies. They'll have dot, 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 dot of levy. You go and hit each individual one before they're able to, like, blob together. Uh, and then you might stand a chance of breaking them a few times. Getting a decent combat score in, as, as war score already. Uh, and just weakening them before they can actually bring overwhelming might um, to bear against you. Um, so definitely, definitely combine your forces together uh, the other thing that I wanted to show you is like how army movement work works so if I decide to march into uh, Schwaben here if I hover over my um, my dude you'll see that this army will have its movement locked on the 9th of November in four days time which will mean it will make it unable to cancel his move right now I can I can, I'm clicking too fast, so I'm upsetting the UI. Uh, but I can click all over the place. I can go wherever I like. But after four days, that's it. I am locked. I cannot change the direction anymore. Um, and that matters. That matters a lot. Uh, because if I was marching to Schwaben and an enemy army was also marching there, and my movement is locked, that might mean that I can't avoid a battle. Let's say I've only got 258 troops and they got 4,000. I'm going to go there and just immediately lose. So you need to be careful when you're moving around that you don't walk into a battle uh, and get yourself um, wrecked in, the, in that way. Um, the other thing is, because we could have enemies roaming across the territory, the AI, if I say go here, it chooses its route based on what it thinks is fastest. It's not... I mean, here we've only got two, four. There you go. There's a good example. We've got two armies, and it's chosen wibbly wobbly routes for them both, and they're not united. Um, and if there was an enemy army here or a rebellion, particularly a rebellion, a rebellion's a great example. If this, if Burn was in rebellion, so we're not at war with the rebels, but if we enter that territory, we will immediately fight them. 
And again, if they got 4,000 troops, at 208 are going to die. So be very careful moving your troops um, around. The option there is if there was an enemy in burn and we didn't want to take uh, damage, we could just select the army from Chor, click on Schwiss, then hold Shift, click on Jurikgo, Basil, uh, and then yeah, you can you could do it that way, and then that way you can draw using sh using the Shift click, you can draw a path that isn't stupid like the AI gives you. Um, so we don't want to raise our levies because it would cost us money. Um, we haven't unpaused the game while these are raised, so there's no negative for us raising and unraising. Um, just quickly show you raising our vassals levies. Um, so if we click raise vassal levies, you can see the piffling amount of troops that our vassals are prepared to give to us. Um, and again, they're raised in the province that they are uh, related to. So we'd still need to bring them together. In fact, you can tell with these, these raised levies are not at 100% organisation. They're terrible. If they fought now, they would immediately lose. Um, so, again, don't raise... Sometimes, when you click that button, when you click raise levies, so I'm going to just dismiss them, it raises all your levies. So if I owned all of this, it would raise every single one. If there was an enemy in Chur, I wouldn't want to raise those levies because they get raised, they'll have zero organization and they'll instantly die and they'll probably have less numbers than, than whoever's invading it. So one of the things that we would really want to do is uh, we would instead click on Thurgau um, and in Thurgau there should be I've got to work out where it is on the UI because I don't do it very often. There you go. Raise local liege levies. Um, so if we click on that, that's raised my personal levy. Um, the, instead, I could then click on the city, and I could raise levy there. I can't raise levy there for some reason. Not 100% certain why. Let me just just oh, there go. They're, they're already they're already raised. Um, so they, they already got raised when I when I raised the levies. Uh, they just got raised alongside my personal troops that just happened to be in that domain as well. Uh, so yeah, you could do that. You could raise those levies separately and then they wouldn't get stack wiped. Uh, well, these guys, you just leave them unraised because there's no point getting them raised to have them decimated. Um, so I'm just going to dismiss those. Notice the difference. When my personal levies are raised, it's costing me 1.69 gold a month. When I raise my vassal levies, it's costing me nothing. And that's because my vassals are paying for their levies. That's why vassals get mad when you have their levies raised. Because they're having to foot the bill for your wars. So if we just dismiss these levies again. Uh, very, very quickly, if we have a look at our liege, we go to his vassals. Let's, In fact, let's just click on one of the malcontents. And hover over his top number, which is the opinion of his liege. And we can see there's a couple of different things in there. So, uh, he dislikes the new obligation law. So, if you remember, we said in the last playthrough, I think, um, that, or one of the playthroughs, we mentioned that vassals uh, that are of type noble do not like having obligation law that means that they have to give more levy. They prefer to pay more tax. Um, so, he's pissed off because the law's gone against the way that he, he, he wanted it. That's a temporary stat debuff to his opinion of his leash. It will expire in about five years time. Um, he's also negative five because of raised levies. He's pissed that his rev levies are raised. He's having to pay for a war that he doesn't care about. Um, and negative eight because of short reign. Remember that our previous leash is dead. His son has taken the throne. And I mentioned short reign penalties before. Um, it's just bad. It's just a straight debuff. And in this case, those things combined together are, are making um, are making a, a peer here really pissed off at Elish. Um, so again, like I said, when you're leading your army, think about what the consequences of that is. Like, let's say you don't get captured, but you get killed. Well, you get killed and your son takes over. He might be an amazing commander, but now all of a sudden you're fighting a war. You might have had your levies raised for a considerable amount of time. This gets worse... This penalty gets worse over time. I think there's another one. This is raised levies. I think there's a levies raised too long as well as this. I could be wrong. But either way, the, the penalty for raising levies gets worse the longer you have them raised. 
Um, us raising and unraising them there will have no effect whatsoever. Uh, but if you raise the levies and you leave them raised, uh, even though it's not costing you money, it will piss off your vassals. Eventually they will revolt just because you've had their levies raised for too long. Um, so you can't just permanently leave your vassals levies raised. Um, and yeah, the short reign thing at the same time. You, you, you've now died, your, levies are, your vassals are pissed off about their levies. And on top of that, now you've got a short reign penalty because your leader's got to suddenly have time to bed himself in and make people know who he who he is, what he's about, and get them to like him. Um, so yeah, um, there was one other thing that I wanted to go through, but I am deeply, deeply conscious that I have been wittering on now. Um, I think with some good content, but I've been going for an hour twenty, and that's way too long. Um, so I'm going to cut do a cut here. Um, Next time, we're going to talk about Zurich Garen Schwiss. Uh, we're going to talk about what, if we were fighting a war, some of the considerations from what we've learned here, we're going to apply to what we want to do in our playthrough. Um, so that's one thing that we're going to have a look at. Uh, there was something else I desperately wanted to look at, and now my mind is going to go blank. Some of it will be, we'll just play the game and describe things as, as we go along. Uh, but we'll definitely do that. Oh yes, hopefully... Hopefully, our discontent lieges uh, court will trigger more people joining this faction. And this faction will get to a point where they create a civil war. That would be quite cool. That happened um, in session... In fact, I could load session 4. I did save it at the end of all those things happening. So I might just load... I might just load that. There'll be a slight, like, discontinuity in what you're seeing. But it'll give me a good opportunity to explain what's going on there whilst also talking about here and it'll show you how to exploit a gap um hopefully i'm, I'm hoping we can find a find an opening to to exploit what's going on in our liege's kingdom to make ourselves more powerful which is after all the point of this game to make your dynasty as powerful as you possibly can right i have talked for far too long i'm going to save this anyway i'll call it session 4.1 uh, but I am gonna, I'm gonna put a cut in there. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you have been enjoying it so far and found the information valuable. Uh, but for now, goodbye and good luck.